Hello everyone. On the 8th of January, Black Moon Lilith, which is the third installment, the third, uh, third uh, turning point in the Lilith myths. And by the way, I have a lot of uh, videos on Lilith and the myths and, and what these points and uh, uh, archetypes mean. So you can refer to that. I'm not going to uh, repeat it, just the most important things. But anyhow, Black Moon Lilith, which is not a, a celestial object, it is the empty focal point of the Earth Moon ellipsis. Uh, but they are very important in comic astrology um, it, because it denotes the uh, returning goddess, uh, the the banished feminine who leaves uh, the Garden of Eden and then hides, uh, goes into kind of some kind of confinement, and then when she hears uh, about the um, uh, the creation, not the creation, the manufacturing of of Eve, uh, she decides to come back and and teach her whatever is necessary to become. A sacred feminine as well, but anyhow, so uh, this this point in in space that we are calculating is quite important, and any any celestial object and any chart point moving into Leo is relevant in karmic astrology because if you take a look at the zodiac, it's the fifth sign, and uh, of it commences after the first so-called introductory signs, Aries, Taurus, uh, Gemini, and Cancer. Uh, where the incarnating soul gets acquainted with the elements. And then after that, and only after that, can it re recreate itself into a new individ individual uh, entity. And that is happening in Leo. So really any, any um, chart point or any uh, celestial object moving into Leo has this flavor, this quality about it, that it carries some sort of creative individuation. It can show its true self. It can show its true potentials, even if it's in exile, by the way. So, for instance, uh, my generation has uh, uh, Uranus in, in, uh, in Leo, and uh, actually it helps us to become a lot more, um, how shall I put it, a lot more, not not really creative, by, but the flashes of in inspiration are filled with creativity, especially if you have uh, uh, this particular celestial object prominent in your chart. But anyhow, let's take a look at what is happening in the sky. And this is the, the exact moment when, uh, uh, when um, Black Moon Lady move, is moving into Leo, which in London, according to London time, is on January the 8th at 13.42, so uh, coming up to a quarter to two. And I'm not going to delineate the chart itself, although I'm going to point out one, one important stuff, because it's very, very similar to the, um, the chart of the Cancer full moon two days earlier. Uh, in this chart, uh, the sun is already separating uh, from Mercury. Mercury is retrograde, so it's a doubly separating uh, conjunction. Uh, out of the uh, very interesting midpoint structure we had, now it's falling apart and only the Neptune Vesta midpoint uh, where Astrea is uh, remains. And of course, Vesta, is the uh, focusing principle. Neptune is your dreams and aspirations and, and uh, transcendence and all kinds of esoteric knowledge and, and experiences. So focusing on these uh, can change your life, can uh, act as a karma breaker. So it's still there. And uh, Black Moon Lilith was infused, still in Cancer, about eight hours earlier, was infused uh, with the moon, which it was actually it's almost like, like 10 hours earlier. So the moon was crossing over the last degrees of Cancer where uh, Black Moon Lilith was. And as soon as the, the Black Moon Lilith moved into uh, Leo, uh, the, the, these two energies were kind of uh, uh, merging as well. So that's that's the only thing that is that was uh, different from the... Uh, the chart, but let's take a look at what the Black Moon Lilith actually is. And here are some facts, uh, quite fascinating, by the way. I gave this uh, video the title, uh, like Black Moon Lilith and the number nine, because yes, the number nine is very much attached to 
uh, the black moon. But what is the black moon? It is, as I showed you, uh, as, I, as the drawing shows you, the empty focal point of the Earth moon ellipses. So the one focal point is uh, occupied by the Earth itself and the other one is empty. And we consider this empty focal point quite important in karmic astrology. There are three different Liliths uh, and this one is the third. So it, it uh, represents the third installment, the third turning point in the Lilith mix. And uh, also, you, I must tell you that there are two ca uh, calculations for Lilith, just like the uh, there are two calculations for the nodal axis. And by the way, Lilith is very much linked to the nodal axis because the, the nodes uh, make a complete round in 18 years and Lilith makes it in half uh, the time. So by the, by the time the nodal axis uh, uh, is reversed, that is when Lilith goes back to its uh, natal position. And we must say uh, returning to its natal position because obviously this is not a celestial object, so it's not orbiting at all. It's just a, a, a calculated point. So here comes uh, the interesting portion uh, that Lilith is very, very much linked to the number nine because it takes nine years to return to its natal position and it takes nine months, almost exactly to the day, nine months to travel through one sign and it takes one day to cover the distance of one degree. So you can see that number nine is quite prominent. So, But what is number nine now? According to Pythagorean, uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, Pythagorean um, numerology, this is what I use, uh, simply because I, this, this is the most ancient one, and also because um, Greek, Greek culture is very much linked to Scythian culture, and because Hungarians are descendants of uh, not just the Huns, but uh, also the Scythians. So to me, that is the most prominent and most reliable numerology. But in numerology, in any form of numerology, you have a, simply nine uh, numbers, not more, because you keep reducing numbers. So, for instance, if you are born, let's say, on the 25th, this is a 25th slash, 25 slash 7. You can reuse any number to its one digit uh, form. And uh, number nine is, of course, the highest in this system. One is the first one and number nine is the, uh, the last. And there's no zero in numerology, quite interestingly. Yes, of course, you have numbers like 20, 30, 100, where you have the zeros and it, it provides you an amplification, but it doesn't have a value uh, in itself. It doesn't, you, it doesn't have a, uh, you don't, we don't link any archetype or any energy pattern to the number zero. Anyhow, what does number nine mean? Well, as the highest of the numbers, of course, it carries wisdom, but it's a very interesting feature about number nine that if you add it up to add it to anything, any number, it gets disappeared. It simply disappears immediately. But when you start reducing it further and further, you get the same number as before the addition. So actually it is linked to letting go. Of course, also, if you consider the fact that being wise uh, requires you to also know when to let go and what to let go. So these two, two concepts are really linked quite well. But it also is, is a, a number of love. Uh, be, because there are three so-called um, divine virtues. You know that there are the four cardinal virtues. Those are for human beings. And there are uh, three divine virtues. And the highest of the divine virtues is love. Uh, one is faith. Uh, the other one is hope. And the third one is love. And uh, this comes in as a meaning only in case uh, uh, nine appears in our destiny number. What is a destiny number? Uh, you have a full birth data, and when you start adding each digit up, you get to a either a double digit or a single digit number. If you are born before 2000, you have a, have a fair chance to, to end up at, at a double digit number. First, we call it, uh, a, we call it the destiny path pathway and then we further reduce it and we arrive at the destiny number and if you if number nine arrives either on your pathway number or your destiny number that is always the highest potential uh, of the number nine and it is not just wisdom and letting go but also universal divine love kind of like, like neptunian love in a way 
And then as an archetype, it, it uh, represents itself twofold. Uh, first uh, is the the uh, brave warrior who is fighting for a noble or a, a divine cause, something like a, the Holy Grail or or for your own country or anything that is 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 really on a very high standard. That is the brave warrior. And the second archetype is the wise hermit who doesn't require uh, uh being in the world living in the world it, he goes away into a cave and contemplates and and prays and and meditates and this this kind of hermit existence is also uh, linked to number nine don't forget that it it disappears whenever you add it up to anything so those are uh, the number nine and as i said uh, the uh, Lilith, Black Moon Lilith, is very much linked to number nine. This is a drawing that one of my uh, students made way back sometime in 2012. I haven't had the time to redo it, but of course it could be continued, but you can get the feeling what this is. It shows the North Node, Black Moon Lilith conjunctions, how they unfold in time. And they give this brilliant um, uh, grand trine structure and uh, they appear in uh, they, as, they, as they move in time uh, in certain elements and they, they give the, the series of, of elemental conjunctions so um, it's, it's quite quite revealing how how you know the, uh, the one of the most beautiful and and uh, uh, most harmonious structures uh, if you consider uh, configurations is the Grand Trine and Black Moon Lilith North Node conjunctions provide you with it in, in uh, you know, as it, as it crosses over the elements. Um, and if we go back to the chart itself, as I said, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, uh, delineate it because the, the, the main uh, purpose of this video is to show you how the Black Moon is linked to the number nine. But of course, there are some interesting features in the, uh, the ingress chart itself. And one of them is uh, around 16, 17 degrees, as the, the sun is really highlighting the structure. You can see that there are a number of uh, things. First of all, there is a, uh, a mutable um, water engine involving the descendant of the London chart, Pallas Athena Wisdom and Vesta, the focusing principle. There's also a, a number of little engines. There's also a, um, a, tri a, a, a heart triangle involving the Sun-Mercury conjunction, trine Uranus, and at its apex is, is Vesta. So Vesta, the focusing principle, is still quite prominent because that is where most of the um, the configurations are meeting. If you if so, that's the focal point. And if you look at the um, um, transcendental celestial object, that there are not too many uh, in this chart. Uh, on the ascendant, you have Alchira, which is a an Aboriginal um, uh, creation god who created who created the whole universe. But after creation, it, it, he just turned around and went to the farthest corner of it and never looked back and never was interested in the human affairs. And this, this denotes a uh, either a karmic wound or a, a, an aptitude or a, a, a behavior pattern where you create something, but you only are interested in its creation, but not in its running or operation. So you just turn your head and, and walk away. So that's on, on that's on the rising point of the London chart. On the on the sun, you have Adonis uh, still, and on on Mercury, you have uh, Merpomene, the, the the muse of tragedies. Uh, Mercury is still retrograde, so is Uranus. So we have, we have a number of uh, retrograde planets still. Uh, everything will turn direct by the twenty second of January. So uh, as soon as the sun moves into Aquarius, everything is lifting up and everything is is uh, how, somehow liberated. And of course, in Uranus, you have another uh, muse. So muses are, are important in this particular chart. But what I wanted to show you really, I just couldn't resist this structure, is another structure that shows you uh, a celestial object at zero degrees. Now, um, the uh, why, why did I do this? 
every time, every time there is a uh, an ingress, you get a zero degree uh, position for any any celestial object. And what you can do, and it's, it's quite a playful thing, and and you can learn from it quite a lot. You can actually take a look at what else is at zero degrees, and then you get a zero degree configuration pattern. Which this is like a, a really a complex planetary picture. You have a number of things. You have a grand cro uh, uh, sorry, a, a grand trine, and actually a, it's a water grand trine, trine at zero degrees. You also have a T square and a number of engines and, and uh, harmony triangles as well. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can uh, you can see these structures. Actually, um, you know, all you need to do is just look at zero degrees. So let's take a look at what is in there. And uh, on uh, Black Moon Lily, because that is what triggered this whole, whole uh, drawing, you have Boethius. And Boethius was a um, Roman council or senator. I don't even know what he was, but he was a philosopher and a historian. And he was executed quite interestingly because he stood up for someone, someone's innocence. And that person was uh, acquitted and he was actually um, then incarcerated and and uh, his main uh, his main work was written just a couple of days before his execution. So if you can uh, take a look at it, it's quite fascinating. And then um, you have a number of other stuff at zero degrees. Let's take a look what actually chaos is still at the very end of Gemini, but I included it in here because chaos will be very relevant in year two thousand twenty three and twenty four. With, with its ingress into cancer and then moving in and out of it. At the moment, it is retrograding. So it actually, uh, it won't happen until I think June. But uh, I, I did, did I make a video of this? Maybe not, but I will, I promise I will. But anyhow, chaos is something uh, that is very relevant at the moment, if you look around. And uh, chaos means two things. Of course, it means creation out of nothing. And this is a uh, this is a skill that we, you will badly need in the upcoming period, how to create out of nothing. And at the same time, it is also chaos, of course, and anarchy. And that is what you see everywhere, especially in the West and especially in the United States, unfortunately. Uh, here in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, we still have some, some decency and some some uh, <laughs> some common sense and rationality. Okay, and then you have Bienor, who is a centaur, uh, who is very, very proud of his own achievements of and very sure of himself. So to be sure, sure proof to be very too proud or over proud uh, is linked to Bienor and uh, the karmic wounds that could be inflicted by it. And then Menkalian is Beta Auriga, and you may remember many of my videos uh, explain that in a constellation, the Alpha star expresses the uh, the, the, the most important um, issues of that particular constellation. And the Beta star usually shows the dark side or the uh, the, the, the simply the uh, the shadow side of it. It's not bad. Uh, stars are not. Uh, uh, part of the uh, solar system. They are on a universal level, and so they cannot be interpreted or delineated with human standards. Uh, a star never brings anything bad. This is something that I would like you to understand. So actually, Menkalian, just by being a beta star, shows you the other side of the story. And of course, um, Auriga, shows you how you can achieve things, how you can become very successful. Don't forget that year 2023, if you add it up is a seven, which is the chariot, uh, which has the same connotation as the whole uh, constellation of Auriga. And the beta star uh, denotes what happens when you don't win? What happens if you are second? What happens if you can't be the victor? Uh, that's, that's what's set at uh, Cancer zero degrees. Um, and then um, uh, on uh, Virgo zero degrees, you have Galhad, the, the, uh, again, a knight in shining armor coming from the Othorian myths. And then two bright star, one is Fekta, which is, uh, which is um, uh, Gamma Ursa uh, Major. And the whole uh, constellation of Ursa, Ursa Major and Minor are linked to 
uh, the goddess energy and the, the, uh, the mo mothering uh, principle. And Regulus of uh, uh, Leo, which again is linked to reign and sovereignty. The whole constellation of Leo is about how you rule, how you can become a sovereign, how you become a king, and what are the, uh, what are the aspects of ruling. On, uh, in Scorpio zero degree, you have Haumea, which is a Hawaiian goddess. This, this is a thing, you know, a Hawaiian goddess who is a fertility goddess and she constantly uh, uh, renews herself and rejuvenates herself in order to have even more and more children. And on, uh, on uh, Capricorn, zero degrees Capricorn, you have Baba, Nyx, Erinia and Sinistra. Erinia, of course, is the Erinus, the uh, the Fates, uh, the dark goddesses. Nyx is is not the night, so another dark energy. And Babel is the Tower of Babylon, which uh, humans created in order to reach God and talk directly to God. And of course, God said no way, and then just destroyed this this tower. So it's the human hubris revolt against the gods uh, that it symbolizes. And uh, Sinistra is the new star of, of uh, uh, the Ophiuchus, the serpent holder. And the, uh, uh, the whole constellation is linked to alternative medicine and lost medicine. Things that we used to know, for instance, in Atlantean times, like crystal uh, uh, vibrations, medicine, and, and um, we are just trying to find it, it again and going back to those, those um, forms of healing. And the new is, is um, the left hand of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Yokos, uh, showing even, even more hidden, even more um, a clandestine uh, ways of healing. And then uh, at zero degrees Pisces, you have Gilgamesh and Tuva. Tuva is a region in Siberia. It's a little uh, region where there are uh, very important shamans. So it is this region is uh, is uh, known for shamanic techniques again healing. And then Gilgamesh, of course, transports us back to Mesopotamia and the Mesopotamian star lore. So uh, those are, are coming in. And then uh, again, on uh, at Gemini zero degrees, you have Urania, another muse. This is the third muse in the in the chart, out of the nine. And then the Pleiades, of course, which are also uh, some uh, some um, uh, stars of the Pleiades are still at the very very end of Taurus, and most of them are already have already moved into into zero zero uh, degrees. Gemini. Archeon, which is the, the, the brightest among them, is at zero degrees Gemini already. So that is a very prominent position in the sky because the whole Pleiades is the um, is the uh, the seat of the Creator Goddess. So that's it. Uh, that's the space time moment. And as I said, the reason for this video was to show you how the number nine is linked to Lilith. And for the next nine months, Lilith is going to be in Leo expressing herself as the, uh, the, the creative individual who, uh, because she is the returning goddess uh, in many sense, so she denotes uh, um, uh, she's well. She's is very courageous. She's also uh, she has a she has a reason. She has a mission to go back to to the Garden of Eden, uh, which she left on her own volition, and she goes back and and teaches Eve whatever she needs. So I I I hope this will bring us some some really creative feminine uh, in the world, not not some new age. Uh, Idiot, and also not, not definitely not the uh, the this vehement, um, uh, quite ugly. Let's put it this way: uh, feminists who who are really uh, trying to destroy everything that is masculine. That is not true femininity. So Lilith in Leo should really uh, spectacularly show what feminine creativity is. And I wish you good luck for this. Thank you for listening. Bye.